welcome in. So the thermal energy, I guess, little mini test here for you for the end of chapter for kind of grade 11. So as usual, I'm going to put up the link for the actual test. So for the PDF copy of the test, you can grab that in the show notes or in the description. So you can open that up um, and then download it. Uh, do it, try it, and then come back to see you know, how well you have done. All right, so let's uh, take a look. It shouldn't take you too long. This isn't a, a bad one. So first kind of, you know, please keep in mind that I will try to round the final answers to the same number of significant figures in the questions that do involve some calculations um, as the lowest number of significant figures um, for the measurements that you have. And I'll try not to round in the intermediate steps. So here's question one. So no much uh, rounding in this one, but it's a very good question to ask. So what is the difference between specific latent heat and specific heat capacity for a substance? So it's a, a question in this particular chapter, a useful one, because what you have studied is kind of two, two, two things, which is the transfer of thermal energy. And you kind of capture that by the calculations of heat but you do it in uh, two different kind of uh, ideas. One is when you are at a particular state. So for example, if you're a solid, okay, if you're a liquid or if you're a gas. And in those instances, if you wanna be able to increase the temperature or decrease the temperature, you're gonna have to either absorb or release energy, so heat. And that relates back to the specific heat capacity in those instances while the specific latent heat involves the actual energy transfer that is needed in order to change state. Okay, so those are the kind of one key difference. One, for the specific heat capacity, it is related towards the fact that you're interested in increasing or decreasing the temperatures at a particular state, and the specific latent heat Okay, is dealing with the energy which needs to be transferred in order to change state. And there's no temperature changes in those instances. All right, so that's one. Now, I do wanna go a little bit further than that, okay, for, for example, the specific latent heat, and I wanna point out things with regards to the units. Now, you will see different units for the latent heat. However, if you are referring to the SI units, then they will be uh, specific, right? So first of all, if you wanna calculate uh, during the change of state, the amount of heat that is um, needed, then it's simply just mass times the latent heat. And this, is, this can be the latent heat of fusion or latent heat of vaporization. So just depending on which state you are changing. And if you notice this, the heat itself in terms of SI units is joules, okay? the mass itself in SI units is in kilograms, and therefore this will point out to you what the actual unit for your specific latent heat should be. And this is going to be joules per kilogram. So if you're being asked kind of what the key difference is between the actual specific heat capacity and the latent Okay, uh, heat capacity, so those are the two that you have, then you should hone in on the units to see exactly what is being done. Now, I'm going to write out, so here, the equation, so this would be mass, times the specific heat capacity, times the change in temperature, which right away will point out something crucial here. So here, first of all, the heat again, so notice check mark, and they're kind of in joules, at least in the SI units. So those units should align. The mass itself can be in kilograms again, if it's in SI units. So, so far, so good. So all of it's the same. However, we have this change of temperature, which we do not have on the latent heat calculation. Why? Because the change in temperature for for the latent heat calculations is basically zero. There is no change. So we can't really talk about that. While here on the specific heat capacity, so the change within a state, this can definitely change. 
So it can go up or go down. So it can be both positive or negative with respect to the change, which will tell us if energy is being absorbed, right? Or if energy is being released, which is not necessarily the case, okay, on the other side. So notice that another key difference is that because of the change in temperatures, which you're going to have typically in degrees Celsius, although you can have it in Kelvin, so those two, the change is the same, so either or will work, you do not have that on the latent heat side. And therefore, so because of that, you will notice that right here, so as you're going through, this K can only be positive just because the mass and the specific latent heat is positive. However, this okay, doesn't have to be positive. It can be negative because this can be a change okay, in the opposite direction. So that means okay, you are decreasing the actual temperature. All right, so that brings us back to this C. So for this C, this has the units of joules per, now it's still per kilogram if you are referring to the uh, standard unit and it will be, so I'll keep it in degrees Celsius, although you can put it per Kelvin. So notice that's a key difference, okay? So right here, this is the amount of energy for every single kilogram or every single unit of mass right? So how much energy do you need, okay, in order to change state for every kilogram or for every gram or for whatever mass unit you're going to be using, that specific latent heat? How much energy is needed for every single mass unit? While the specific heat capacity, okay, so within here, this is related to how much energy is needed, hence the joules, per every kilogram or every mass unit if you're going to change it by one degree Celsius, right? So that is the ultimate um, key. So here, specific latent heat, you can add, there is no change in temperature, while here there is a change, and therefore it is reflected that we are interested in how much energy will be needed to increase, okay, or possibly decrease the amount for every single mass unit, so kilogram, for every one degree, either Celsius or Kelvin. So there you have it. So that's kind of number one. You know, you can certainly write that out for yourself in terms of some of the bullet points related to one or the other. You should know the difference between latent heat and heat capacity, right, and what they are actually measuring. Here is question number two. So for this particular example, convert the following temperature readings to the appropriate unit, right? So you do run into different temperatures and you should be comfortable with the fact of changing between different temperatures. So you typically have all degrees Celsius, right? Degrees Fahrenheit and then Kelvin. I can put up a link up above there to refresh you. Okay, so what those um, items are related to and then you can try some more examples, okay, within that link. So within here, let's give it a try. So for part A, so this one is not going to be very difficult for us because we are provided, so within here, so we have 56 degrees Celsius, so we can substitute it right into the second formula in there, and we can find out what the degrees Fahrenheit would be. So if I do that substitution, so that's 56 is equal to, so 5 over 9, I will do that all the way through, I'm gonna just put TF right there. So now this is just a matter of solving for this, right? So it's not very difficult. So here, multiply both sides by nine over five. So this is gonna be just getting rid of this. And you would do that on the other side as well. So nine over five, so that's the first thing. So nine over five times 56. That's just gonna leave you with the TF minus 32. You can bring that now over to the other side, which is going to be a plus. So that's going to now take you this. I'm going to duplicate it. And now your subtraction becomes a positive. So that's that. And there you have it. So take out your calculator. Now we can go ahead and do that. So 9 right over 5. So we have 1.8 times 56. So it's going to be 100. 
0.08 and then plus your 32 and that's going to be quite a quite a scorcher there 132.8 and that would be degrees Fahrenheit for us now because we started with two significant figures so I'm going to do that so it's going to be 130 degrees Fahrenheit so let's leave it at that that's part a all right so now part b so let's kind of switch it up to that one so we have now given kelvin and now we want to go to degrees fahrenheit so this actually is going to be kind of a two-step process from the point of view of these two formulas that you have so first of all so for part b so notice you can take this formula to change the kelvin into degrees celsius and then you can substitute that back into here and then you're going to have the same problem as you had in part a so again not a big deal so let's take a look and see it so first of all so this is now just changing so this is into degrees celsius so you're starting off with 298 kelvin and you're substituting it in so minus 273 so very quickly you know you can put that in 298 minus 273 so that's 25 and now you have degrees celsius right so so far so good now take it and substitute it back into the second formula so into this formula so we're going to have 25 is equal to and now again you're stuck with the 5 over 9 right so tf minus 32 and you're going to do the same thing again so multiply both sides by 9 over 5 okay to get rid of that so that's going to be the first step plus the 32 which you're going to be shifting over and that's going to give you your tf that you need all right so since i did it in the previous example um, in part a so i'm not going to repeat it here so this now you can of course substitute it back in okay so 9 over 5 which is 1.8 so times the 25 and then sorry plus the 32 and that's going to be 77 so there you have it all right so it's 77 degrees fahrenheit we started with let's see in here so that's that has three sig figs 298 so if you want to write this out as three sig figs just put it in this form okay, with the decimal and then you have that and again reminder of sig fig rounding you can put that up there as you need it so that's example number two so here is example number three. So it's hopefully now we're going to get into a little bit more complicated items. An unknown substance with a specific heat capacity, so which is given. So let's write this down. So we have a specific heat capacity. Notice the units, they're not in standard units in here. So that is joules per. So that tells us just how much energy we need for every single gram for a change in every single step in temperature size and that's kelvin so it will be the same thing as degrees celsius for us right so you can interchange that i'm going to leave this for the moment okay not worry about the unit we'll try to make the units um, later to, to to see what that would be so this unknown substance right has been heated to a temperature of 116 degrees celsius now you have to be careful here this is not the change in temperature this is your final so it has been heated to so i'll put tf for final all right so that's your final temperature and don't forget that the change in temperature is your final temperature right minus your initial temperature right so this is it okay and i'll just maybe use that okay within here so i'll put a little f that, that's your final that's this one right there the mass of the substance has a has the mass of the substance has a mass of okay so that's a, an overkill there so the mass of the substance is let me just remove that so that mass is 85 grams the amount of heat needed to increase the temperature was so the amount of heat needed so that's q so 450 joules calculate the initial temperature all right so we're looking basically for this that's what we want now in order to get that you should recall so q is equal to m c delta t so now let's substitute everything in so we have 450 that's on the left hand side i'm going to keep the units 
because I just want to make sure that everything is kind of consistent. So notice joules, joules, that's fine. Um, here is grams, here is grams, that's okay. Now the Kelvin and you know the degrees Celsius, so they should align, but luckily the change in Kelvin and the change in degrees Celsius are identical, right? So we can just swap that. So we're in here, so that's not a big deal. Um, we are gonna be looking for the change in temperature so the mass we have, so I'm gonna just leave mass in grams, right? Multiplied by, so it's gonna be 0 0.189, this is joules, per gram um, Kelvin, right? So which is the same thing as degrees Celsius, multiplied by the change in temperature. So notice the gram will cancel, so that's fine. That's out of the way, we just have now joules, okay, right there. Um, now the only thing that you have to do is you have to divide both sides by these. So let's do that. So that's gonna be 450 joules divided by, now notice it's gonna be 85 times, and this is gonna be 0 0.189 you know, you know, joules per degree Celsius is equal to the change in temperature. So those joules will cancel. Now that degree Celsius is gonna go up, which is exactly what we want. It's gonna go up in the numerator and let's see what this number will be. So that's 450 divided by, we'll put this in brackets, 85 times 0 0.189. So I'm putting all of the denominator inside the brackets, dividing it, so this is 28.011, etc. degrees Celsius. That's the change in temperature, all right? So, when we're doing this, okay, so if we're changing the temperature by, you know, let's say 28 degrees within here, so all I have to do now is take this, substitute it back into here. That's not going to be very difficult. So it's 28 point, you know, etc. I have it on the calculator. My final temperature was 116, right? So this is right there. And then all I'm doing is I'm just trying to find my initial temperature, right? So here, if you bring over the TI over on the other side, you're gonna get 116 minus the 28 point, you know, et cetera. Okay, so within here, and I guess we're gonna have two sig figs anyways. So this is gonna be 116 minus the 28. We don't need the rest actually because of the two sig figs. So that's gonna be your starting temperature, which is 88 degrees Celsius. So there you have it. So that's another example. Um, this one is with regards to specific heat capacity, okay, for a state. Now we don't know what the substance was, it doesn't matter to us. All right, let's take a look at another example. So here is example number four. The specific latent heat of fusion, so this is melting, so we're basically melting, okay, and notice it's copper, so that's what we have there, has been found to be, so this is, 207 joules for every single gram. So going back to that first example, so it's not per kilogram, this is actually per gram. So for one gram, you would need 207 uh, uh, joules of energy to actually melt this copper, right? Now, if the amount of heat needed to fully melt the copper was 248.4, kilojoules, so be careful on the unit there, then how much copper was there in the beginning of the process? Provide answer in kilograms. Okay, so no problem. So let's take a look at this. Now it is asking us to provide answer in kilograms, so I'm going to change the grams to kilograms in just a moment. So this is the specific latent heat of fusion, so that's of melting in this case. And what we have, this is 207 joules per gram. So if you want to change it to kilograms, well, there are 1000 grams in every kilogram, right? So you don't need to do that. You can just simply multiply it by a thousand or shift your decimal over. And this would notice that the grams will cancel. So what this is going to give us, um, you know, 1000 is a kilo, right? So this is kilo. And actually, so this right here, so since the copper itself, notice that the Q, okay, in, is given us 248.4 kilojoules. I'm gonna just keep that kilo there. So this is gonna be 207 
thousand joules, which is 207 kilojoules, all right, per kilogram. All right, so that's what we would have there. And that's kind of going to be useful because now the units align. Kilojoules, kilojoules, and I need kilograms. So to provide my answer, this is going to be Q is equal to M times L, right? So this is the fusion. Now Q is 248.4 kilojoules. The mass uh, we are trying to actually find out, okay, so the amount of heat, so we're trying to find how much copper was there. So I don't know what that mass is. And I do know that this is 207 kilojoules per kilogram. And notice the units all align, so these will cancel, and I'm going to get kilograms for my mass. Now, this is just <clears throat> dividing one by the other. So 248.4 divided by 207, so that's 1.2 kilograms all right so we had um, so within here so 207 248.4 so you can certainly write this with three sig figs as i see there so you can write it like that but i don't think your teacher would be upset if you just put 1.2 so it's actually quite a bit but it is um you know it's quite a lot of uh, actual energy that we would need okay in order to melt this so that's another example for you. That's question four. So here is the last one. So question number five on this little mini test. Let's take a look and see if we can knock this out. So you currently have 450 milliliters of water sitting at 18 degrees Celsius. All right, so that's what we currently have. So let's, you know, let's imagine. So here is our kind of water. So we have 450 milliliters, and that would be volume. Now, don't forget, okay, is that one milliliter of water is approximately one gram. So this is, okay, oh, the same thing as saying we have 450 grams, okay, of water. Now it's sitting at a temperature, so this is Ti, so initial temperature, of 18 degrees Celsius. All right, so that's from right there. The specific heat capacity of liquid water is 4.184 joules for every gram, okay, if we want to change it by one degree Celsius, all right? Okay, so that's the next piece. The specific latent heat of vaporization, so this is going from a liquid to a gas, and that would be the vaporization. I'll put a little V there. So that would be 2230. That's joules per gram. All right, so it's, it's quite a lot for every single gram. How much energy would have to be transferred to fully vaporize all the water? Okay, so provided in kilojoules. All right, um, so we can certainly provide it in kilojoules. Okay, I'll, I guess I'll do that at the end, um, because I'm just noticing I have grams, I have grams, I have grams, I have joules, I have joules, so everything kind of aligns in this case. And now what we want to be able to do is we want to be able to do this to this water. So we're kind of stuck, okay, so within here at 18 degrees Celsius. We have to bring this water temperature up to the boiling point, which is for water 100 degrees Celsius. If it was, I'm assuming that it's just plain water. It's not like salt water or something like that, because that would be a little bit different. But in any case, so this is our actual first step. So we would need to find out how much heat, okay, would need to be transferred to raise the temperature. Now we can certainly do that. So for step number one, so let's maybe do that first. So our Q is equal to, we are having 450, so that's my mass, um, uh, grams, this is noticed that it's grams, 4.184, this is joules per gram, okay, so those grams will cancel, and then we wanna bring it up to uh, basically the 100, so that's the change of temperature, right? This is your final minus your initial, so that's 82 degrees Celsius, so that's 82, and calculating this, is going to give us 450 times 4.184 and times 82. 
So that's quite a bit. 154389.6. This is still joules because I had it in joules, okay, right there. So that's step number one. Now, this brings up the temperature, right? So that's the heat needed to bring up the temperature. Now, at this point, okay, so now that we're sitting over here, the water, okay, so all of this water is now sitting at 100 degrees Celsius. Now we want to see it vaporize, right? So vaporize, that means it changes into a gas, you know, so how much would we need? Well, so what we would have to do now is we kind of have to have step number two, and this is going to be our, um, this is where we need our latent heat and or calculating that latent heat, which is going to be the mass. So that's 450 multiplied by 2230. Notice joules per gram. So the grams will cancel. And this will tell us how much energy we need for that. So 450 multiplied by, so this is 2230. And notice it's, it's quite a lot, 1003. 500 zero, zero joules and now all the water is gone right so it means it just vaporized and all you have to do now is you have to add these two together so since i have this already so plus one five four three okay eight nine and point six not that that will matter i guess so that's going to be one one five seven eight eight nine point six that's joules so now if you want kilojoules so you're going to be kilo so you're going to shift this over by three so that's going to be one one five seven point you know eight etc now let's see we had i guess let's keep it so two significant figures so if i round this it's going to be one uh two zero zero kilojoules right rounded to two sig figs so there you have it. So quite a bit of energy that we would need in order to fully vaporize this water. All right, so that is it, okay? So for this little mini quiz, let me know how well you did. Um, you know, hopefully give it a thumbs up and that you found this useful. Thanks for watching and we'll see you in future videos. Bye everybody, happy studying.